class presented by City and County Broomfield. My name is Dave Jackson. I'm the Environmental Services Coordinator for City and County Broomfield. This is part of our green calendar classes for 2021. This is the fourth class. If you missed some of our other ones, please check us out on broomfield.org on the Environmental Services page, and you can check out this class as well at a later date if you need any info from it. Quick outline for the class tonight is uh, covering rainwater harvesting, um, history of rainwater harvesting and rain barrels, um, the active and passive rainwater harvesting techniques. So active being rain barrels, passive being working with your yard and making adjustments and stopping the flow of water. And we'll get into that at the end a little bit and kind of integrating the whole process to help reduce water use. So a little history here for Colorado. Um, water has been very contentious throughout the years. And the old saying was, whiskey's for drinking, water's for fighting. So there's been a lot of back and forth about water law and water usage and who gets what. And that's why it took so long to get a rain barrel law passed in Colorado. So here's some general terms for water rights in Colorado, first in time, first in right. Uh, we have junior and senior water rights and they were allocated as beneficial use. Um, so yeah, this is just kind of more showing how contentious water law is in the states and um, also interstate uh, compacts that we have to, um, as a headwater state, we're responsible to provide water to neighboring states downstream. So we can now keep water that falls on our property. And so this is just kind of a breakdown showing that seven states divide up water that comes from our watershed. So it's really important that we look at all of this when, uh, when making these rules. So here's a couple other uh, laws. Senate Bill 09080 uh, was for a domestic well application for resident, uh, for homeowners, mostly like property owners. So you know, it's, this isn't completely new. Uh, the, the rain barrel law isn't completely new. So there were a couple other ones out there before, and these just specify those. So yeah, a study was done and it was decided that senior and junior water rights were not affected by rain barrels. So the current rain barrel law is House Bill 16-1005 and was enacted in August of 2016. So basically, here's a description of a rain barrel, a container with a sealable lid. It's located above ground outside of a residence and used for collecting precipitation from a downspout from a rooftop. So you can have up to two rain barrels with a combined storage of 110 gallons. So this is based on a 55 gallon drum, which is a pretty typical size. Obviously in this picture here, this is not legal. So the apartment complex on the right would not be eligible for rain barrel use if it has over four units to the building, then they can't apply uh, a rain barrel. So in this example, like a townhome um, could utilize two 55 gallon containers. So not per residence, uh, but per this structure. So under four. So again, here's another breakdown of what's allowed and what's not. So 110 gallons per building, not apartment. And the water has to be used on the same property and must be used outside. So you cannot take this in your house and use it in toilets and for washing and things like that. So HOAs cannot prevent rain barrels. Uh, the Colorado law supersedes the HOA, um, but they can regulate where you put them and what they look like. 
and how they're screened for uh, mosquito control. And we'll get into that in a little bit. So again, legally using your water outside, uh, you cannot use gray water systems. You cannot bring this water into your house. It has to be used outside. And you can't harvest storm water either because once it's on the ground, it is off going off your property and it's not part of your active rainwater harvesting system. So using your water on plants, trees, gardens, that kind of stuff is ideal for rain barrel use. And again, not for washing or drinking, any of that stuff. So how much of an effect will it have on your water use? Um, you're probably not going to save a whole lot of money. Water's pretty cheap, but it is important that we all do conserve water, and this is a great way to do so. So a lot of factors play into this uh, total precipitation. You know, in Colorado, we have infrequent rains. Sometimes we get a lot, sometimes we get a little. And um, obviously the size of your lot and how much you're able to use, and then the type of plants you have as well. So I think this is a good statistic here. A lot of people are concerned about, you know, am I going to have to plumb my entire roof uh, into these rain barrels to catch, uh, you know, a full container? And you really don't. It's surprising how much you can actually get off of one section of your roof. So this is just a breakdown showing if an inch of rain fell on a thousand square foot roof. So like, let's say a 50 foot by 20 foot section of roof that would collect 600 gallons of water in a one inch rainstorm. So quite a bit. So 110 gallons will cover about a 15 by 15 square foot garden with about an inch of water. So plenty of water for your garden. And the benefits, it's free water. And the water quality is typically good. It's unchlorinated, so your plants will like that. And also it has nitrogen, which it picks up in our atmosphere since the air is mostly nitrogen. So it picks that up and then it actually causes that greening effect that we see after a rain. So you, rain barrel use, um, rule of thumb is to use it within a week and try to drain it after a month if you hold onto it too long because you don't want it to start to grow things in it, possibly algae. And it's really important that we use them. If, uh, if we set up these rain barrels and we don't use them, then we're keeping this water out of the water cycle. So this is just a little breakdown here of um, what it would look like if 20% of homeowners in a thousand unit neighborhood that had rain barrels, if they weren't using them, they're holding up 11,000 gallons from entering the water cycle. So in winter, you wanna disconnect your system. You definitely don't wanna have this on your hands. So basically you just, dump out your bin at the end of the season, turn it upside down, turn the spigot open and store it that way until the season picks back up again and get it set back up. So mosquitoes can be a problem. Uh, mosquitoes can hatch in as little as a bottle cap of water. Um, we, we deal with this every year, of course, here in Broomfield. Um, so yeah, it's important to make sure that we keep our bins free of any sort of larval stage mosquitoes. So they have to have a sealable lid according to the law. And if you're planning to be away from home for a while, it's probably a good idea to disconnect your rain barrel uh, from your downspout while you're gone. And it's always good to just empty your barrel out every month just to make sure you're not uh, harboring any mosquito larva. So your overflow hose off the bin, which we'll look at here in a minute, uh, needs to be at least eight feet. It'll prevent the mosquitoes from climbing up in there and trying to find a water source, a stagnant water source. And you can also use screening. You can put a screen at the end of your hose if you don't want to use an eight foot hose uh, coming off your tank. And also these mosquito dunks work really well. I'm not going to try to pronounce what this is called, but BTI is the active ingredient and kills mosquito larva. And you can find these pretty readily at local hardware shops. So again, water quality is pretty good. 
Uh, infrequent rain allows times for bird droppings, dust, other contaminants to build up on rooftops. Uh, therefore, a lot of systems have these first flush diverters attached to them. So basically, when that first flush comes off the roof and the water comes in through here, it'll actually fill this chamber up with that first flush of contaminated water that might have the nasty, you know, bird poop and, you know, dust and stuff like that. So once this chamber fills up, this ball basically cuts off this um, section here, and then it's allowed, the water's allowed to keep flowing onto your rain barrel. So a first flush device, uh, they're effective at removing contaminants. Um, the first several gallons obviously are gonna be the one that contain the contaminants. So that's basically what we're trying to get rid of here. And lighter colored containers, uh, translucent containers can have some algae issues. The darker containers are better for not allowing light transmission. And if you do have any sort of algae issues, you can use a 2% bleach solution, rinse out your barrel really well after you do this and just you know watch out for different types of algae. Um, they can have some toxins that are harmful. So overflow can be an issue, um, definitely can cause some foundation damage. So definitely make sure um, you've got this set up properly because you don't want this. So your overflow is right here, as you can see, um, two to three inches from the top, and it's directed away from the house and down into a concrete pan to get it away from your foundation. And another option here too, is you can run two barrels in, in sequence. So basically your overflow would be a second barrel. So you don't need to utilize multiple downspouts on your house, you can actually just have two barrels like this image over here on the right shows. So once this first barrel fills up to this line, it would move over into your second barrel and then your overflow uh, would allow it to continue out from there. So the catchment area is your roof. And asphalt shingles are fine. The old wood shingles do uh, contain some chemicals, so probably not a great idea. And metal roofs tend to shed some contaminants as well. Don't see a lot of this though anymore. So here's a breakdown of a half inch rainstorm. So if a rainstorm came through, dropped a half inch on a 40 foot by 20 foot roof, uh, we would get 252 gallons here and a tenth of, rain, tenth of an inch of rain would get 50 gallons. So you could fill pretty much one, uh, one, one container. So this just goes to show that, you know, you don't need a ton of rain to fill these up. And over the course of a year, it could equal hundreds of gallons. So make sure you store it in a safe place. These are heavy barrels. Uh, you don't want them teetering or on any sort of like uneven ground. Uh, just be careful when you're setting these up and using your tools. And there are companies in the area, if you look up uh, container reclaim uh, companies around, you can find places that actually have cheap barrels for sale. And here's some other examples, bakeries, delis, feed stores, bulk food service. Uh, places where you can do a DIY project, or you can go to your local store here or online and order a kit and uh, get set up that way. So here's some different options for sealable lids. You can have an open top like this with multiple holes with a screen over it, small enough that the mosquitoes can't get in. And this one on the bottom just shows like a, a different style of, of lid that you can use. Ideally, you want this downspout to be less, uh, not further than an inch from this opening. So again, here's just a quick little breakdown of what we're looking at. So the, the inlet on top, your, out, your overflow outlet on the side here, and your spigot for your hose, you want it three to four inches off the bottom to avoid sediment. So obviously that being said, this would not be a good choice.
And gravity feed systems, um, these don't really work too well. You really have to get these barrels up in the air three to four feet uh, off the ground to really get the water pressure going. Um, you really just don't have a lot of flow here. So it's just best to use uh, watering cans you fill with a hose and then just take it out into your yard where you wanna use it. So here's a image of an elevated Bin. So basically you get it off the ground a little bit and it's going to create some pressure and it's a lot easier to access this stuff like your spigot and your hose when it's up off the ground and the height of the water column here will help with your water pressure as well. So a foundation for putting your barrels on uh, pavers, concrete blocks, this stuff works really well for this. Uh, wood can rot from uh, weather, rain, you know, just dry rot in Colorado's weather. So concrete's a good way to go. Um, pavers do look pretty nice uh, aesthetically. And um, yeah, this is a good way to get your barrels up off the ground. So here's kind of just an overall list for you uh, to verify, you know, if you want to look back at this presentation and kind of go through and see if you're doing a DIY project. There's a lot of good videos out there, a lot of good um, instructionals uh, online, as well as um, the rain diverter kits like uh, this person's putting in here. So basically the diverter kit goes into your downspout and can be removed during the winter time. And those come with great instructions as well. And they're uh, pretty reasonable priced. So again, you're, the easiest ones to get set up are the prefab ones from the store. They do uh, definitely gonna cost a little bit more, but they are nice and they uh, usually are pretty aesthetically pleasing. So just some things to look for uh, when you're buying one, sealable lid, proper spigot placement, 55 gallon or less. And there's a lot of different options out there. So find what's right for you, do a little shopping around and and uh, I'm sure you'll find something you like. So the DIY project, um, not as easy as a setup. It's definitely going to take a little bit more work, but here's just some uh, views of some options that are out there, usually like food grade, bin, storage, uh, stuff like that can be reused for a rain barrel, as well as uh, even a sealable lidded trash can. So here's just some parts list that you're going to need if you're going to build your own. Um, these saw sets that go in your drill bit um, that'll cut these holes in the bin so you can assemble all this. I won't show you this video. This is a good video uh, link here. Um, you can come back and uh, copy um, or just jot down and put uh, into your browser for YouTube. It's probably a 10 minute video of a guy doing a full setup and uh, it's, a, it's a good watch. So again, yeah, first step, you wanna install these spigots and drains. So this is what the drill bit looks like that's gonna drill the hole in the plastic and just be careful when you're doing this, try not to get stuck like this guy. So again, elevating the barrel, just some different options here. Again, wood's not great. Um, plastic, concrete, brick, paver, something like this would be best. And your downspout attachment, there's multiple different ways to do this. Um, whatever works best for your system. I like the diverter kits because they allow you to just unplug them basically during the winter time and then it just goes back to your normal uh, function gutter. And don't forget about leaves. Leaves can be an issue. Um, so if you do have trees, tall trees in your area near your house, um, you will want to have some kind of uh, protection for your downspout so you're not getting a bunch of leaves collecting in your rain barrel. So here's the diverter kit right here. So basically you, you drill this hole into your downspout. This rubber gasket basically fits inside and it doesn't catch 100% of what comes down the inside of the downspout. So it allows some to flow uh, back you know, down into your regular system and it will catch some of that water. And um, yeah, so these are kits you can get all around town, different home, uh, you know, Home Depot, different shops, so tools, um, wherever. 
And last step or next step is integrating it into your backyard is trying to find a nice place to put it. Um, and you know, selecting a good location with a with a good section of roof to drain to. So here's some pictures of again the overflows and kind of where to, to, to direct this um, overflow water. So we'll talk a little bit about passive rainwater harvesting now. Um, so that was the active part, the rain barrel part. So Passive is diverting water over the over your property into vegetated areas for immediate use. Uh, the three keys here are slow it, spread it, and sink it. So we do that using gutters and downspouts, swales, berms, French drains, and bioinfiltration gardens, which we'll look at. So you know, just to get an idea of your property, start to look at uh, a flow map, or you know, just watch when it rains at your house, and you can kind of see which way uh, rain wants to flow. Um, usually. Each property is unique and has a different flow pattern to it. And this would be a helpful thing to think about before you start putting in any sort of passive harvesting. Again, yeah, this is just another schematic showing some ideas of like, you know, using arrows and which way high points where water is going to flow. So ideally, these high points are going to flow towards um, water needing like trees and, you know, things like that. So. So yeah, it's rain, passive rainwater collection is an age-old practice. <clears throat> Excuse me. So here's integrating uh, swales into your property. So basically these swales right here will slow this water down and then you can add in some rocky areas to allow water to flow through. So again, just another image of different ideas people have used for um, spreading out water, getting it to move across the property. Okay, another technique is berms. So this creates raised areas where you're gonna slow the flow down and it has time to sink into the ground. So you can put gardens and things like that um, on the inside edges of these berms. So this is the ideal berm right here. You want it to be a transition uh, from the existing grade and the slope should be gradual like this, not this mound of dirt like this. Um, this is gonna work a lot better. So French drains are an option too. Uh, this spreads and slows the water out. Kind of a cross section of what it would look like underground. And here's installation of a French drain before it's covered up. So this is kind of what it looks like. So the water will be able to percolate out through these holes and into this rocky substrate so it can spread out in your yard. And bioinfiltration gardens, they do all three. They spread slow and sink. And they also create a, a good place to uh, the clean water, basically. It almost works kind of like a wetland. So you got dirty water in. It filters through these plants in the sandy soils and comes out as clean water. So there's a lot of benefits to all of this, which are listed out here. So for placing your garden, your rain garden, uh, you just wanna look for a place where the rainwater naturally occurs and, and runs into a low, a low point. Uh, just think of like how water flows follow the path of least resistance and make sure to keep them 10 feet from buildings, 35 feet from septic tanks and 50 feet from sewer, uh, from water wells, excuse me. So native plants are always good. They are well adapted to wet and dry cycles like we have here in Colorado. And a lot of these water wise or xeric type plants can be found on this plant select website. I believe we touched on this a little bit too in the uh, Xeriscape class a couple of weeks ago. And this is a pretty good website. Definitely check it out if you're interested in looking for some good Colorado hardy plants.
So here's kind of just an overview of everything. Um, so, you know, all of these can work together. We can do active and passive and uh, really make a difference in our water use. So here's a nice picture of a bioinfiltration garden. And Broomfield residents, you are open to our rebate program. So uh, residential water rebates up to $50 per rain barrel. And you can also apply the cost of a diverter kit to the rebate. So you can get up to $100 if you purchase two rain barrels. And here's a link to the rebate page. And just so you know, we do offer rebates for toilet replacement for uh, low flow toilets and also smart controllers for irrigation. Um, and also nozzles, the different types of nozzles for the um, sprinkler system. And all of that can be found on this page. So here's some numbers to look at. I thought these were pretty interesting for Broomfield specific in 2018. Uh, these were some of the average uses for a day. So the reason it says average combined is that Broomfield water, uh, Broomfield's also on Denver water partially. So these are combined Denver water and Broomfield water use for these days. So August peak in 2018 was 21.6 million gallons on August 13th. It's a lot of water. And in July was the peak day, July 11th was 24.5 million gallons used in our community. And just for perspective, uh, the wastewater facility receives about 6 million gallons a day on these days. So all of that, it just goes to show that all of this is being land applied somewhere irrigation wise out in the city. So again, here's some more stats. This just shows uh, water use by month. And as you can see, June, July, August, we're at or over 600 million gallons used in 2018. So um, definitely a, a good reason why we should start conserving water in Broomfield. And I think that concludes my presentation. Thank you everybody for attending. And if you have questions, feel free to reach out to me. My contact info is listed here at the bottom, djackson at broomfield.org or my desk phone number is here. And um, I will take some questions now if you guys have any, just uh, post them in the Q and A on the Zoom.